Welcome to uh, Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Valeria Komisarova here and from uh, Grishin Robotics. And we're going to start uh, to talk about how she got into robotics and why she, she's excited about the robotics field. It's a great story. It's a long story. In fact, it's my third or fourth profession, I think. The first was software engineer. So I, I actually always was very close to technologists, like mm -hmm. all my life. And I, it's hard for me to imagine what I can be in some different industry, frankly. Mm -hmm. So the second um, profession was really around marketing and public relations and writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been writing all my life, you know, very different stuff. I mean, I wrote the book mm -hmm. about programming drivers for Windows operating system. <laughs> I believe it was like Windows 2000. <laughs> I mean, it was some time ago. Mm -hmm. But um, gradually, I was just starting to write more about business side of the things. I mean, it just became interesting for me, not just to create the actual stuff, the technical stuff, but to see how you can build the business from it, right? Mm -hmm. How market mm -hmm. works and how business model works. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, there is a, a lot of stuff going on right now in robotics with it. How mm -hmm. you not just build technical stuff in robotics, but how you actually make a product from it, a platform for it, a business from it, right? And um, actually, so right now, a venture capitalist investor and in robotics, mm -hmm. it's like my third profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, I believe it kind of blends very nicely everything what I have learned so far. But of course, I need to learn significantly more. And I mean, it's a process which never ends, right? Yeah, so. I mean, we all do that. Robotics is evolving so fast yes. that we are all learning all the time. And I really hope that we can share your, your knowledge with the viewers and have them learn by watching these videos and get the insight uh, that you have. So when did you start working for Grishin Robotics? Uh, actually, I started to work in the company like two weeks before we actually announced that launch. So a little bit before the beginning, I would mm -hmm. say. And right now we launched on June 15 of 2012. So right now we are almost two years and a half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is the, what was the, when you, when Grish Dimitri created the company, what right. was his vision and how are you then executing on that vision? Yep. So, a little bit of background here. He studied robotics in the university, mm -hmm. so he's even much more closer to that than I ever been till this moment. And you know, he built this pretty big internet company of him, and he is still CEO and chairman of board of this company. Mm -hmm. But not surprisingly, for robotics and hardware, like physical stuff in general, mm -hmm. always been a very big passion of him. And I mean, he, I really wanted to change something, not just in online worlds but like an actual physical world around mm. us, something we mm. can touch and see and feel and everything. But of course, he is a very good businessman. And uh, in addition, and even despite mm. being very excited and passionate about technologies and how stuff works, I mean, he's very hands-on. And he was a software engineer too, so mm. he knows how to do this. I mean, he mm. wrote a lot of code at the like, very, very early days of my Dario group. Mm. But he also been always watching like what's going on with robotics industry from a business perspective, how it's evolving, like what's going on and kind of with different areas of robotics. And um, he built consumer facing businesses where he was also especially interested in consumer applications of robotics and consumer robotics. And you know better than me when it, a couple of years ago, like 2011, 2012, it became clear for him, for some people, and gradually it's becoming clear for more and more people around the world, but the situation is changing. The, you know, we like to compare and he likes to compare the industrial and consumer robotics, like what happened with transition from mainframes to personal computers. This democratization process, the process when the barriers to entry for startups are getting lower. And of course, in that case, you are really getting the real innovation happening because you don't want innovation to be happening in a few places. Like in some big corporations, in some very universities, in governments, you want to have a lot of trial and error. Mm. You want to have like the law of big numbers to work, right? And uh, there were like a couple of drivers for that. I mean, falling down cost of component, 3D printing, crowdfunding, improvements in supply chain, both in developing and developed countries. And the combination of all these factors, it just seemed like finally a perfect timing for the consumer robotics revolution to come and the perfect timing for him to f start this company and to put his, some of his own personal money, actually $25 million so far, 
to fund some of the companies which can actually bring this robotics revolution. So that was the vision, basically, to make consumer robotics revolution happen. And uh, back then it was still, I mean, pretty wild idea. Uh, like, frankly, when we just launched, I mean, they got pretty good coverage. I mean, robots, I mean, everybody knows Rosie Jetson and everything. <laughs> you know, all the science fiction books and all, you know, science fiction movies. But still, you know, decent percentage of people around us, even like very accurate business people, said, like, are you crazy? <laughs> What's, what the hell is robotics is? Mm-hmm. I mean, and how you are going, again, how you are going to make business from it, actual business. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've seen robotics in university labs, maybe in industrial floors, mm-hmm. but like finally robots in our homes, how you are going to do that? But I mean, a couple of, even like just a couple of months later, like gradually, I mean, the again, crowdfunding thing, like mm-hmm. hardware projects and robots, they started to get funded, they started to get a lot of media attention, mm-hmm. and people started to talk about hardware tsunami, hardware revolution, and of course, the robotics is a very big part of it, and consumer robotics in particular. And then people kind of started to believe. And it just, you know, I think what we are seeing, and again, like, you know, with many of the industry events from year to year, and with media coverage, the market is gradually starting to happen and more and more serious investors starting to pay attention to it. I mean, there are more deals, the big companies entering the game, many more startups, many more interesting projects, ideas are getting tried. So it's, you know, it's getting more professional, it's getting more institutionalized. And uh, I mean, super exciting to be part of this process, right? Yeah, it's it's really the golden age of robotics, uh, startups and entrepreneurship now, I think. What was the feedback you got? Who, who, Who was it? young people wanting to start a company that got back to you? Was it college professors? I think it was really everybody. <laughs> everyone. You got a mail from everyone. I mean, they got a lot of emails, I yeah. would say, a lot of incoming requests, a lot of contacts. And uh, I mean, it really was very, very different audiences. Mm. And I mean, of course, the entrepreneurs were like, you know, very excited about it mm. because there was this very long period for everybody. I mean, venture capitalists, they're supposed to be venture capitalists, mm. right? Mm. They're supposed to invest in high risk, high reward stuff. Mm. They're supposed to move like whole industries forward and open up new verticals and everything. Mm. But the interesting things happened and it was actually another part of the motivation for Dmitry to start this because Venture capitalists became a little bit too risk averse. They were not venture anymore, they were just risk capital. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, they, I mean, the internet was doing and it's still doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, all the Twitter, Facebook, Google, I mean, tons of companies, all these IPOs and M&As. I mean, it's it's a big multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. And they kind of um, understood a couple of business models. And uh, they've seen the success stories and they were like very reluctant to go outside of it. They really wanted to stay inside of what they kind of already understood. They mm. thought a little bit and kind of learned something about a little bit. And they just really wanted to find another Twitter, another Facebook, another Google. And exactly as you said, I mean, they perceived like the physical and actual products significantly more riskier and significantly more capital intensive and everything. And a lot of entrepreneurs who've been also excited about building actual physical stuff and changing something around the physical world around us, mm. they've been getting really hard time getting funded. And I mean, they've been getting rejections just all the time. Mm-hmm. And actually, it's interesting, crowdfunding helped with that a little bit. Because I mean, it's both a little bit source of capital. It's also huge, like popularization uh, technique. I mean, you can test your... Your market and exactly. the feedback you get from our exactly. customers. And it also helps to get more professional funding afterwards because kind of, you know, venture capitalists, angel investors, whoever, they kind of starting to be a bit more comfortable. Mm. I mean, there is some proof of customer demand. There is some kind of feedback you've got. You know, there are at least some money you got into the company. So it really helped, you know, very significantly. But again, getting back to the drivers of growth we've been talking about, it a lot of concerns all these investors been like very, you know, upset about, they gradually starting to become less relevant. It's getting less capital intensive. Mm, it, it goes faster. Exactly. It takes mm. less time to prototype. It mm. takes less time to build, to manufacture, to actually go to your customers and everything. And like the combination of all these factors, it's um, now 
persuading a lot of investors to look closer to it, you know, into the space and kind of try to understand it better. But a few years ago, the situation was, you know, significantly different. And of course, I mean, probably the entrepreneurs was, I mean, one of the happiest groups who kind of reacted to our launch back then. Can you tell me about the companies that you've actually looked at in detail and right. the one that you didn't fund and that the one that you did fund? What was the difference? If somebody's out there and watching this, how should I make a really good pitch? And by learning from the people that submitted to you and right. that didn't get funding or that did get funding. Actually, it's like four big questions. Hmm? So yeah. I will try to yeah. answer them one by one. First is uh, what kind of stuff you looked at and mm. what kind of stuff we are looking at. So uh, as I probably already said, we are really focused on the consumer side of the mm. things. But the, as always, very interesting question is what the robotics is and how do you define what the robot is? Mm. Because we have this fairly uh, in comparison to the definitions like many like even like traditional robotics universities and professors use and many traditional robotics companies use, we have fairly broad definition and understanding of what robotics is. We do think that the, the nature of robotics is changing, especially on the consumer side and how we used to perceive and see like what robots, how they should look like, what they can do and how they kind of integrate it in our lives. It's changing very significantly and not the least because of you know consu um, sorry sensors revolution and I mean through the sensors a lot of things around us they are becoming robots mm -hmm. they are becoming smarter mm -hmm. of course you may not really notice that because if you have this like fairly traditional fairly constrained vision what for robotics is mm -hmm. anthropomorphic something with mm -hmm. legs and hands preferably with AI and moving around, <laughs> bringing you beer and something like that. I mean, you don't really see a lot of robots like that around. I mean, at least not in a real life, mm. not in a wild, I would say. I mean, We're quite a way off from Rosie Jetson, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> or Bender for that matter. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, you've seen these projects on university labs, but again, we are really excited about robotics, which can already change the actual people lives, right? Mm. Who, you know, which can solve actual problems already. Mm. That's, that's what was most exciting for us. But in that sense, when we are uh, talking about what we are looking at, it's really broad um, range of smart consumer hardware, uh, including, you know, some pieces of Internet of Things and connected devices. And I mean, autonomous vehicles, right? Mm. They're becoming robots on mm. the wheels. So, and it's, you know, I just think that are the many more facets of robotics uh, mm. people normally not even think about. And the, as a you know, consequence of that, they, we have currently nine companies in portfolio. And uh, I mean, it's a pretty broad range. It's truly presence robotics. Mm. It's educational robotics. It's like entertainment robotics, but essentially it's not just, in, I mean, it's a very different kind of inter entertainment robotics we've had so far. It's like the whole new idea of connected play. And it's interesting stuff, you know, with connected uh, play and like entertainment robotics. And there were some cases like, you think it's like a robotic ball or something, it just moves around. But it's inside there may be and there is a very sophisticated tech involved. You mm. can't really see it outside, but mm. very often it's much more complex when you can actually think when it's like rolling around the floor or something. So it's um, actually it's viewable out like viewable robotics and it's even nanosatellites in space because they honestly believe they are robots in space. I mean, yeah. they're getting more and more autonomy and I mean, they're performing a lot of these kind of tasks. So um, getting to the question like the, a lot of companies we've seen which were not funded by us, mm -hmm. um, here it's not the question of specific verticals we like or we do not like but of course i mean for example we do not we are not really into the medical mm. robotics because i mean i like to say it's it's more about medicine mm. when it's about robotics mm. and it's just totally different industry mm. and there were a lot of vcs who are very good professionals at that and who spent like last 20 years investing in medical devices. Mm. They are not going to compete with them. And also because, I mean, they're really interested in, the, you know, the investment in all these companies, it's not just purely financial exercise for us. No. I mean, it's just, you know, there's definitely part of emotional connection to companies you are investing in, like how you self is really excited about this stuff. Mm. And it's also about what kind of added value we can bring to these companies and getting back to the beginning of our conversation again, Dmitry built consumer-facing company. I mm. spent my whole life in consumer-facing companies. 
and again, we know a great deal about how to commercialize the stuff, how to deal with the business side of the things, marketing, you know, scaling and everything. I mean, Mitchie built this company from scratch to 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. He took this company public and he can learn our portfolio companies. He can teach our portfolio companies a great deal how to deal with like scalability issues in their businesses and everything. And actually, it's interesting, I mean, the internet and software pieces, you know, is like very good and I know, you know, very good about, it's becoming very important part hardware business i mean the hardware mm -hmm. and of course you need to get the hardware part very very right mm -hmm. but still a lot of value is i mean without software robot robots it's blind it's deep it can actually yeah. move around it's and just everything a it's just a bookend right <laughs> exactly it's a, it's a yeah right it's so a combination yeah yeah it's, it's, a it's a paperweight right exactly yeah so it needs that internal um, and also the connection to the outer world exactly so that we can communicate with it yeah in, uh, and there's a whole stuff of cloud robotics, which mm -hmm. is very connected to software and internet pieces as well. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, you know, we are not looking into kind of verticals. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot clearly see what kind of added value we can bring. Mm -hmm. So when we are not funding the company, it's not the, you know, more question, not the kind of vertical it's operating in, it's about different factors. Mm -hmm. And again, what we are already started to talk about a little bit, is it a technology? Is it a product? Is it like platform kind of interim stage? Or is it a business? And of course, as a venture investor, you want to fund business. And uh, I mean, robotics is like very fascinating industry, right? It's mm -hmm. more fascinating than many others. And uh, there are a lot of people inside of this industry who are super excited to be a part of it. Who are super excited to build very advanced, sophisticated technology from a technological perspective, robots and products and everything. But it has like two, you know, the you know opposite side of that because when we are very excited about product and the technological side of the things, it's a bit difficult for them to think about customer need, about the problem they are going to solve with this technology, right? And I think that. First and foremost, I'm not going to tell like this, you know, pretty obvious thing. We are looking for a great team and everything. I mean, it's it's Everybody pretty obvious. Everybody knows that. Also. Exactly. It's mm. pretty obvious, right? But I think the first and foremost, it's the right culture. Mm. It's the right mindset. And I strongly believe it has to be in the company from the very beginning. I mean, sometimes, and you know, relatively often, entrepreneurs think about, for example, design. And when I'm talking about design, it's very important. It's not just about external appearance. It's not just about what kind of color your robot will have, right? But it's about the whole user experience as ID, and it mm. has very different aspects in it, right? And very often entrepreneurs say like, you know, we will hide design shop afterwards and mm. it will make our robot beautiful. I mean, no guys, it's not, I mean, of mm. course your robot has to look beautiful, mm. but it should be part of your DNA from mm. the very beginning because the whole idea of a user experience and the only way you can do it right is to start with the customer in mind from the day one, from mm. the very beginning. And it should penetrate all the aspects of the company, really. Mm. So it's really, you know, it, it has to be from the very beginning in the company. And I think it's the core thing we are looking for. Mm. There are a lot of like, you know, the price point is important for the consumer market, the design they already talked about, mm. and you know, you know, the software and this hardware software component, what kind of data you are collecting about what the robot is doing, what kind of insights you are able to extract from this data. There are a lot of pieces. But this kind of cultural component, mm. I think it's especially important. And like, you know, they're not quite related, but the interesting thought is, uh, you know, we are in Boston right now, right? Mm. And like, you know, the cluster of robotics companies, universities and everything. But the interesting thing we've been seeing for this last two years, is again, primarily with consumer robotics, mm. a lot of consumer robotics uh, innovation happening not just here, and maybe not quite primarily here. I mean, it's too early to tell mm. what's go you know, what area is going to emerge as the key robotics cluster, especially for the consumer robotics. Mm. But a lot of stuff is going on in Silicon Valley. And interestingly, I mean, there are a lot of software folks. I mean, they've done a ton of mistakes with hardware. You know, all these crowdfunding campaigns, they screwed up everything. I mean, from prototypes all the way down to manufacturing, to distribution, to getting into the retail chains. I mean, uh, it's very, very different in many aspects from building and, you know, launching and scaling software product. But the interesting thing, I mean, of course, they iterated. They've done a lot of mistakes, but they had the right culture. 
They already had this lean startup methodology and everything with culture of starting with the customer first and, you know, iterating very fast and not just, you know, having like concepts what the consumer wants or needs, but actually getting out there in a real physical world, asking him or her what, what, what does she want, right? And like observing how the, this product is actually going to be used and iterating on this feedback very quickly. You are getting to market like significantly faster with this kind of approach. Mm. You have a significantly better product than otherwise, right? And it seems like a lot of more like traditional robotics companies who used to be very focused on technology or even on products, they kind of struggling sometimes a little bit with getting and cultivating inside of themselves this right culture. And again, that's what we are looking for. In if there is no this component, I would say, no this culture in the company, it's it's really difficult to make it funded. So it's probably getting to the last of your questions is uh, kind of advice and perfect pitch. I think it, you know it pretty much answers the question problem you are solving, customer you are targeting, targeting, your value proposition, how your product is going to solve all that. And I think, it's, you know, additional component to that is really, you have this product, which again, going to solve some specific need or everything. But what is really interesting in how you are going to build not just company right now from this, but really long term sustainable business, right? You want to go to IPO like 10, 15, 20 years, right? How you will get there? Not just to some kind of, you know, long-term financial report or something, but how you will grow your product line, how you will grow your platform. For example, you know, including the dating component as well, right? You will be able to, you know, connect next product to this data platform you started to build and, and on and on and on. So you have to think about it from the day one because I mean, you may, you know, build something like two niche or just, you know, one hit products, it happens. And of course it like happens out in entertainment robotics, like Furby or mm. Theo, I mean, one hit, so what's next, right? Mm. You know, mm. and uh, sometimes it deals with fashion as well. I mean, consumers do not like Furby or, f you know, Plio or whatever anymore. And it's like, you know, like you the Hollywood movies. You have to reinvent yourself all the time. Exactly. Right? If you're looking at the future, both for your portfolio companies and for your, f for robotics in general, you're very connected with what's going on in robotics. Um, what makes you most excited about the coming through your four or five years in robotics? Uh, what are we going to see? What are we going to be able to use? Oh, I know it's a, it's a great question. And to predict the future, it's like the worst task one yeah, can yeah, imagine. Yeah. I and think we will hold you to this, of course. Five years I know, now, it's a video, this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you will remember and you yeah. will pin me down. Uh, yeah, yeah. No doubt about it. That's also very nice. So. <laughs> And I've tried to do the same thing self. I know it's hard, but it's always, you got this um, feel, you, f you have feelers out on the market and you communicate with your portfolio companies and with many right. others. You're in a unique position to tell us what we're going to see three to five years from now, I think. And any feedback you'd have on that would be. Yeah. So before I will actually answer, I will still give a, a couple of disclaimers <laughs> um, to have like no legal obligations. No. <laughs> uh, like 20, 30, 40 years ago, when you would stop somebody on the street mm. and ask like, do you know what a personal computer is? Mm. And if even somebody knew, like, what do you think you can do with that? And uh, as far as I know, those kind of, you know, surveys, they've been actually performed back then. Mm. And as you can imagine, they had like terrible results. I mean, nobody knew, nobody had like a single idea like why you need this gray, you know, block something, right? What you are able to do with that. But we know what happened, right? It just completely transformed like the entire planet, right? Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is even, I mean, many big corporations back then, not just the regular people on the street, a lot of big corporations, universities, I mean, they had, you know, they had some ideas, but, you never, you never know for sure, right? Mm. And the interesting thing again, when you're inventing some kind of technology, right? I mean, some time ago, there was technology of, you know, transferring bytes and bits from one room to another through the cable, right? Mm. It was an internet. And took some time and took the right people, you know, a lot of right components to actually make the internet from it like, and web, web and all the web businesses we have right now. So, and I think it's, it's, it's just really hard to predict. And um, I think here 
there is also this component that, again, when you are, the more people you are inviting to the table, so to say, to think about it, uh, the better. The more, the, the greater the probability that the sooner somebody will come up with some great ideas how to apply this or that technology to that specific use case. And we are getting here to the point of lowering barriers to entry for startups. Mm -hmm. It's not like 200 very smart people at IBM or General Electric thinking about it. It's like, you know, millions of students around the world think about it. And as we know from the internet, like students can be pretty good mm -hmm. in coming up with interesting ideas, which kind of growing into the big businesses, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, if you're like in your 20s now and you got a solid foundation in software and hardware, yeah. you're at exactly the right place to be the next Wozniak or Jobs or whoever or, or Bill yeah. Gates. And Absolutely. So I think this first component is really important. Uh, second is, I mean, we can point right now to some verticals where we see something we just think is happening, right? Mm -hmm. It's clearly like home automation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just vacuum cleaning and we have in some smart, or well, not so smart washing machines, mm -hmm. but there were clearly a lot needs to be done. I mean, I'm sure you will agree there are a lot of tasks you hate to do in your home, right? Yeah. And some tasks that I, uh, that I like to do sometimes, but not all the time. Exactly. I, sometimes I simply don't have the, the yeah. opportunity to, to cook a nice meal and I just want something to eat, right? Because the kids are here, it's panic. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, your life is like that. And yeah. That's true. Yeah, so the home automation, I think, is huge, but it's also very hard. Have you seen any interesting opportunities for you to invest in there? I think what we've seen, it's uh, largely on the Internet of Things side. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, smart devices which help you cook better. Like, for example, you know, the sous vide or something mm -hmm. like that, like very precise temperature measurement or something. I mean, there were like smarter, you know, like some kind of smart personal assistant or, you know, everything. There was some smart furniture. I even have seen something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's still in the experimentation phase. Like, again, people are um, still thinking at, about it largely from a technological perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, they're trying to put sensors in everywhere, what they can see about them, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to automate everywhere and they just see what will stick, right? It's not, not you know, best or worst approach. I mean, it's kind of, you know, approach a lot of startups are using right now. And uh, the sense of home automation um, is definitely, I mean, around transportation. Mm -hmm. We already mentioned autonomous, autonomous vehicles here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for example, there are um, a bunch of interesting startups who are kind of, you know, improving the bike. Mm -hmm. I mean, bike is awesome, but it, it still has its downsides, mm -hmm. right? And the problem is the kind of rate of penetration, like how many people are actually using a bike to commute, to everything. And it's important, right? Because it's related to much bigger social and economic and whatever problems, congestion and, you know, impact on the environment and, and, and everything. And also exercise. I mean, I Physical. used to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you take your bike to work every day, uh, you're, 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 you're good. Be, yeah, <laughs> you're good. But again, you have that steep hill. Yes. Exactly. And you don't want to come to work and then take a shower. That's not practically possible. So you want to go there, yeah. but you want to do it in a more convenient fashion. Huh? That is true. And I mean, there's this local Boston-based uh, startup here called Super Pedestrian. And I just tried it a few days ago. And it's a pretty cool. It's almost like electric bike, but not quite. And there's a much more sophisticated technology inside. But the way how it assists you mm -hmm. in certain situations when you're biking, not all the time, like when you're again going up a hill and everything, it's, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think there were a lot, I mean, the, we had the Segway, I mean, it didn't really materialize, right? It didn't really penetrate our lives. But I think when there are a lot of challenges we are facing in terms of transportation. And it's both like human transportation and it's also like business transportation, right? Mm -hmm. Because the shipping industry, it's, mm -hmm. it also sucks, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there are grossly inefficient. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a lot of waste and it's still pretty expensive in many ways. And again, we're not talking here again about in environmental impact and everything. But I think there are a lot of uh, ways how sensors and robots can help to improve. Like from a pretty mundane pick and, pa mm, uh, pick and you know, handling already mm -hmm. uh, and placing and everything, what we already have, but how sensors getting, you know, integrated into the warehouse to like make the, all the movements inside of our house more efficient and more optimized and everything. So I think it's a kind of a second big, very big topic. And actually related to that is the topic of telepresence. And it's interesting because, you know, telepresence has been around for years. 
I mean, they all seen a bunch of telepresence straw, but some mm. of them ugly, some of them not so ugly, some of them very expensive, some of them not so expensive. Mm. But still, I think we're just scratching the surface of what mm. is possible with telepresence. I mean, there are some use cases right now, like iRobot doing stuff on like in health telepresence. Mm. I mean, our own portfolio company, Double Robotics, it's like widely popular in office environment, and especially for remote workers. But there is still much more can be done, uh, for example, on the same health side, than people who can actually attend school or university or work they are sick or like they have allergies. I mean, there are different conditions. They still can participate and kind of feel that they are out there and interacting with people around. And it's way better than Skype. I mean, it's about psychological perception. It's very important mm -hmm. when they're talking about like human robot and human to robot to human interaction, right? And, but still, there are many more use cases, like, you know, travel. Mm -hmm. We can eliminate a lot of business travel through the clever use of telepresence. There are, like, leisure travels and, like, entertainment. And, like, for example, I mean, the Twitter really likes to use this example. Like, I mean, the museums, they're closed at night. Why not to, you know, put a bunch of telepresence robots out there and they can ro they sell the tickets, like, to tune in to this sort of presence so they can roam around everybody happy. Mm -hmm. I finally it at the Louvre and you know mm -hmm. the museum is getting utilized the night time. I mean everybody is happy. So and it's also related to transportation um, very closely and how you can roam your remote factory around somewhere. There were again many more verticals like drones, a lot of interesting stuff is going on there. But again I think it's really what I how I like to see it, we can't really imagine all the possible verticals right now. And exactly as you said, some time ago, the industry is very young. And all of the startups uh, who are working right now on this industry, they have to be like very open and very like, receptive of what's going on around. They will need to iterate like very quickly, like enormous amount, you know, number of times and everything. And they, you know, they're working on like, Markets not quite existing yet. The, the product they don't quite know whether it fits or not, and the customers changing constantly. So there's a, a lot of iteration, a lot of experimentation will take place. But again, the right attitude, the right culture, you should be good. You should be able to handle all that and kind of you know change yourself. You know, pivot. You know, the enormous om amount of time you will need to pivot. Here, I think, um, you know, software eats the world, right? and it's been eating and eating and will eat for some time, continuously disrupting vertical after vertical, industry after industry. And I think the same will happen with robotics, with hardware, with sensors in general. But the, just that the verticals they're impacting and the impact they have on them is much bigger. Because, yes. Yeah, because it's out there moving, moving we, stuff around in the world. I mean, right? there were like this science fiction idea some time ago, but they've been all go virtual, right? Mm. You know, virtual communication. I mean, everything will be virtual. It didn't happen, right? No. I mean, we're living in a physical world. Right? Exactly. We are still physical creatures, mm. luckily. And I mean, there are a lot of physical stuff <laughs> yeah. around us happening. And it, it just means that there are a lot of inefficiencies and not all of them can be automated or improved purely just, you know, software, right? It must be in some combination of hardware and software. Mm. And in that sense, I think the hardware is going to eat a lot of industries, a lot mm. of verticals, and going to disrupt them one after another after another. Mm. Pretty much everything can be and is going to be disrupted. So it's just a question, again, how you're finding this use case where, again, the robotics makes sense mm. right here, right now already. Mm. Thank you very much for taking the time to do an interview. I'm very grateful for, for that. And I hope to see you soon again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoy this episode of Robots in Depth. Please subscribe, share, and visit us on robotsindepth.com. You can also support us on Patreon. Robots in Depth is supported by Optomica and Robots of Close. Optomica, rent anything in modular robotics and build whatever you can imagine. Robots of Close, travel the world and see what's going on in robotics right now, up close and personal. I would also like to especially thank the organizers of the Robo Business Conference for their gracious assistance, without which this interview would not have been possible. I am Pasha Avoy, and I thank you for watching.